Hi, welcome to Intro to AAC Implementation, Basic Talker Training, Part 1, Getting Started. My name is Anne. Thank you for joining me in the pursuit of successful communication for your student or family member with complex communication needs. Communication is not simple. Think about the last time you had to go to a doctor and describe a health problem. Did you feel like you got your point across and the doctor really understood what was going on with you? What did you say? Now think about one of your best friends. Try to remember when you first met them. How did you go from a stranger to an acquaintance to a friend? What did you say? In both those situations, communication wasn't in itself the goal. Communication was your tool to accomplish something. It was your tool at the doctor's office to get the help you needed. And it was your tool when you met someone new to form a meaningful relationship with them. This is an important concept to learn and remember as you start implementing use of this communication device. Think of communication as a means to accomplish something. Communication includes the device, but it also includes facial expressions, body language, gestures like pointing, noises like positive and negative sounds, behavior, anything that sends a message to the communication partner. If you can get your friend's attention from across the room by waving and smiling, you've accomplished your goal. Many of the students I work with are accomplishing their goals of getting something or escaping something by using communication. They have a goal in mind, their own original thought, and they accomplish it. The problem is with the way they're communicating. In my earlier example of waving and smiling, if those were suddenly inappropriate, such as waving and smiling at a person giving a eulogy at a funeral, it would seem like waving and smiling were disruptive and counterproductive. So we should always look at the goal of the communication, which is referred to as the function. We shouldn't focus on the way it's being communicated, and the way is referred to as the mode. Behavior specialists frequently analyze the functions of behavior and develop plans to shape the mode. For example, in the PEX protocol, when a student reaches for a toy, their hand is redirected to a picture card of that toy so that they'll use the picture card to say they want it instead of just grabbing it. The behavior of grabbing the toy has been shaped into grabbing the picture card. Both ways or modes accomplish the goal of getting the toy. The goal, which is called the function of getting, which is called requesting, didn't change. Only the mode changed. I just want to be sure that you have a good understanding of these concepts beforehand because it will affect the way you problem solve different situations that come up during implementation. Please answer the next four questions to ensure that you have a solid understanding of these concepts. Now reflect on how you felt when the quizzing started. Did you have a negative reaction to being asked quiz questions? Most people do. It's unsettling and you feel pressured. 
Now imagine how your student or family member with complex communication needs would feel if you put their new communication device in front of them and quiz them on where certain words and buttons were located. Can you find the apple? Where's the I want button? Show me how you say all done. How do you get to your snacks page? Find the button for more. Where's pizza? Where's bathroom? Where's book? Research shows that this is not the most effective way to teach use of a communication device. Remember how communication in itself is not the goal? The goal is to use communication to accomplish something? Your student or family member needs to be shown how this works. When they're being quizzed, all they're shown is that the communication device is used to quiz them. When taught this way, it's not surprising that the device is seen as work and it starts being rejected by the individual. Talkers are tools that must be modeled. What is modeling? It's a research-based AAC intervention referred to as Aided Language Input, or ALI, Aided Language Stimulation, or ALS, or Partner Augmented Input, PAI. Basically, all of those are the same thing. They're modeling. And we all know that modeling is showing. It's showing the student how to do it so they can imitate. We all prefer a model in life when we're learning. How many times have you gone on YouTube to watch a how-to video before you just tried it yourself? Imagine if someone was standing over you and verbally prompting you to do it without you getting to try it yourself or getting to watch a YouTube how-to video. That would be the worst option. Prompting is standing over a student and telling them to do something. It's asking a student to follow a direction. When prompting becomes the routine, the student actually expects it. This is known as prompt dependency. When the prompt is suddenly removed, the student does nothing. We want to reverse the curse. My recommendation is to use a least to most silent prompting hierarchy. It starts with waiting and expecting communication. This is often forgotten in the moment because we're so busy, go, 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 we have a schedule to keep, and we jump right in and try to help to get it done. But I recommend we wait, take a deep breath, and see if the student can figure out what to do on their own. If they cannot, then we can jump in and start by giving number two, a general gesture cue. This would be a gesture in general towards the AAC tool, such as pointing to it or pushing it closer to the student, like a reminder that the AAC tool exists because maybe the student is very out of practice. If they still don't respond to that kind of prompt, we move to a more specific gesture cue. We're pointing to the appropriate button or the device activation point or the particular PEX card. We're even moving our finger to get their attention, like we're about to do it for them, but we're not. They need to follow this silent prompt. If they still don't follow that level of prompting, then we move into four, five, and six, which are the physical prompts. And I want to note that these should only be used if absolutely necessary, which means that you've already tried one, two, and three. And they should be backed off of right away so that the student doesn't become dependent on them. Backing off of a prompt is called fading. So number four is the partial physical prompt where we move the student's arm by pushing their elbow so that their hand hovers over the target that they're supposed to be touching. If 
They linger there and hover. I like to tap the back of their hand to silently prompt them to use their hand. And if they still don't respond to that, then I lastly use a full physical prompt, which is known as hand over hand. And it could also be done as hand under hand to make the student activate the target, push the button, or pick up the PEX card. I never jump to this because I'm not teaching in an errorless manner like I do during PEX trials or DTI instruction. I'm looking to see if the student can do it independently. And even if they make a mistake and do it wrong, I don't jump in because I want to see if they notice they made a mistake, can they self-correct? Those are all different skills that I want to measure progress in. So if I jump in and do hand over hand, I'll never know where they are in their progress. And lastly, the reminder is no verbal prompt should be used throughout all these steps. We are zipping our lip. Although it's the least intrusive to the student, because it doesn't invade their personal space when we say things to them. Um, it's the hardest for us to stop doing, and therefore it becomes a routine, and the student depends on it. They expect it, and they'll actually not do anything because they're waiting to hear that verbal prompt. So in order to protect ourselves from creating that prompt dependency, we need to zip our lip. So naturally people ask me, okay, if there's a right way to prompt following the hierarchy, when's an appropriate time to try doing it? I recommend a strategy called third party prompting. Prompt when you're not in the conversation. Just facilitate the interaction between the student with complex communication needs and their communication partner. For example, if you are a one-to-one -one support and the student is going into a classroom and the classroom teacher greets them, the student should respond and reciprocate the greeting. How can you get them to respond? I recommend using the silent, least to most, prompting hierarchy. If the student just waves hello and that gets their point across, they've accomplished their goal. They do not need to go on to their talker just to say hi when this was enough. But if the teacher asks them, how do you feel today? There's no good way that they can communicate that answer without using words. So that's an opportunity for you to use the least to most prompting hierarchy to silently, from behind, out of sight, wait, then point or tap the device, then point to the particular folder that would get them to the feelings. Then if they still haven't initiated it on their own, moving into the physical prompting by tapping their arm, tapping their hand, or doing hand over hand. Now, a lot of students start to get a little bit frustrated when they're being prompted. And so in that case, I note here on this slide, if you're the silent prompter following the silent prompting hierarchy, you could also switch to modeling if the student resists the prompting. You know your student very well. You can tell when they're starting to get escalated. Now you're in a battle. The teacher is still waiting for the answer. We need to move on. It's always better to switch to you as the adult modeling going into the feelings folder and pushing whatever you think matches what the student is really feeling based on you knowing them very well. And when you model, so you push the tired button, the communication partner, the classroom teacher, should respond as if the student just said, 
tired themselves and just move on. This gets us out of the interaction that was probably not going well once you started prompting them. So it's important for the classroom teacher to be aware that there's certain questions that, that can be answered non-verbally, like greetings or yes or no questions, but there's other questions that require language and then they need to invest the time to wait for you to silently prompt and facilitate the answer to that question. They also need to know that when you model, they should acknowledge that that's the answer and we're done. So to review the difference between modeling and prompting, modeling places no demands on the student, so it shouldn't upset the student versus prompting which forces the student to comply so the student is likely to get upset. Um, students with complex communication needs have been dealing with a lot more frustrations than most people for years so their tolerance for prompting is probably a lot lower than a typically developing student and we should expect that they resist prompting and in that case we would just switch to modeling. So I'd like you to feel the difference for yourself. I'm going to prompt you first to say, I like that. So this is my verbal prompt to you. Say, I like that by touching the symbols on the screen. Now I'm going to model for you, you do not like to stop. Did you spontaneously imitate me? If not, I'm going to do a no-no and verbally prompt you. Please imitate my model. You do not like to stop. I'm assuming you're done, and I'm going to ask you, did it feel twice as hard to do the second sentence? Most people say no, but in fact, the second sentence was twice as long as the first sentence. The reason it didn't feel twice as hard and the reason it might have even felt easier than the first one is because I provided you with a model. Remember that feeling when you are tempted to just tell your student to use their talker instead of showing them how to use their talker. They're going to be a lot happier, they're going to learn better, and they might even spontaneously imitate you.